So I'm going to do a, a, a short um, video introduction in the shop and then I'll probably put a couple photos of this before I took it apart to finish and stain it with some voiceover in this intro as well just so you can get a better idea of what this is going to look like because right now it's all in pieces. can't really see what's going on especially with the angle I have this set up um, in the shop. But basically this is going to be a fairly long series because this is a gigantic coffee table. It's five foot by five foot. It has a lift top on one side. It has three storage drawers down here on the other, as well as a hinged lift stop over here. And then another table desktop coming out this way. So not only is it extremely large, but um, it has a lot of mechanical moving parts. So that usually translates into longer build series. But like I said, this one was, was a nice challenge. Um, I actually really liked the way it turned out. The b first video is gonna be making the basic frame, pretty standard for this shop. Everything's going to be made out of mortise and tenon, the, the frame outside. And then from there, we'll get into building out the rest of it. So these are just the couple pictures I mentioned in the introduction. This was before stain and finish went on it. These are what I send to the customer before. Take everything apart to put stain on it. I choose to take stuff apart because it's easier to get stain and finish on all sides of the piece, which is I do recommend um, how, to, how to do it. So to start with this, I'm gonna start with the four corner legs. I got this material off of eBay. I've had success with getting um, lumber like this off of eBay, and these were supposed to be three inch legs. Um, the problem with them was they came a little undersized three inches, and by the time I finished them, they were about two and a half. So I was a little upset about that. That's the problem with getting supplies from various suppliers. When you buy three inch material from a lot of places, it's similar to buying four quarter material. It will be a little thicker than what you need it to be and then it planes down to the size that you want. This was already undersized, um, but I did make it work. So what I'm gonna do is clean up all the edges first. The easiest way for me to do this is on the table saw. You can see I pointed out that these don't really rock on my table saw, which is important. If there's any sort of severe cupping, twisting, bowing in this wood, I do not recommend doing it this way. But these only really had little flanges sticking out the side, which is really easy to clean up on the table saw. So all I'm doing is setting the fence to remove that little bit of an angle. I'm going to send all these pieces through. It will take off that angle and then that will be my reference edge against the fence for the next side. Like I said, I have a planer in the shop. I don't have a joiner. So this is just the easiest way to do it. Um, but it, it only works with lumber that's already somewhat straight and not severely compromised. So once I send that first edge through, you can see I just move the fence over a hair because I don't want to, I'm trying to keep as much material as possible because these were already skinnier than what I wanted. So I just turned, I moved it over a little bit and you can see I'm removing maybe a 16th of an inch on this side, getting a nice clean edge. I'm going to do that with all of my pieces. One of these had a big indent, um, which I did not remove because they would have been extremely skinny if I did that, because obviously I have to get these all to the same size. All I did for that was, was mark it, and I cheated that bad part onto the inside of the cabinet where the drawers are, so you'll never see it. So right now we're sitting at a little over two and a half. And what I'm going to do now is I have two true sides, the, the, the top and the bottom, and I'm going to do the exact same thing on the other two sides. I'm going to rip down that little bit of an edge. Once I have that ripped down, I can then use that as the reference on the fence because it's pretty straight and then send them through. It's important that these are square. But for the type of thing that I'm building, if these are all not perfectly identical, it won't really mess up the build. I'm always a little hesitant to say that because people will take liberties with that. But within reason, if there's some minor undulations in this, it, it, it will be okay for this sort of build. And then just before I started, because there was a little bit of a ridge on some of these, I went through with a belt sander and just cleaned them up because I have to put mortises on all these. That is going to be the next step. And wanted the surface to be as flat as possible. 
So there's my finished stack. You could see compared to when I got them, they're nice and, and clean. And I was a little bummed about the sizing, which was most likely just a misinterpretation of the listing. Um, there's the part that I was talking about with the, the indent, which I cheat onto the inside of one of my pieces, but this ended up working out. So the main lumber I'm using for this is going to be red oak. I got these boards from Rockler. I was pleasantly surprised at the price they have for boards that are surfaced on three sides compared to rough sawn lumber. It's only about a dollar more than where I usually get it. And it means I don't have to plane or joint it in the shop. Compared to a place like Lowe's, which I will admit I will sometimes get lumber from Lowe's, these are about half the price. So if you have a Rockler by you, they do have some great prices on some lumber. If you don't have a lot of tools, that material is already ready to use. I like to get it sometime just because on a big build like this, I had a couple other projects going on at the same time. If I could save myself an afternoon's worth of shop labor, planing them, it equals out to the added cost and um, I could save half a day. So this had a pretty specific height on it and it's also going to have lifts so that was just I had all the calculations planned for how um, wide the aprons had to be in order for the clearances for all the hardware that's going inside the cabinet. So basically these legs were I believe 18 and a half inches tall and then my top rails were going to be about four and a half inches. So then all I'm doing for these is I'm going to cut these down to size. Um, pretty, pretty simple. And then I have my pieces. I drew out my mortises on my first one. You can see I marked center and then I can go through. I shifted these over a little bit. I have a 3 8 inch mortising bit in my mortising machine. It's a little bit skinnier for what I wanted for this. My material is a little, is about, is closer to 3 16 of an inch versus 3 quarters. So I'm actually going to run these through twice. So what I'm going to do is these are going to be haunch tendons. I like to do that. It's similar to how I do breadboards because the haunch makes it so that especially on these longer thicker boards they're less likely to twist over time. So I'm going through and I'm putting one continuous mortise on the top part of this piece. That's about um, half of an inch down. Once I have that one continuous mortise, I'm going to break this up into two mortises. So I'll have a haunch on my tenons and then double tenons going in. So that is basically what I'm showing. That's my first pass. I can move the fence back a little bit and send it through again. You can see I had moved over my marks from the original drawing I had. I didn't want them as close to the edge as I originally had. So that's why those are, are thrown off a little bit. I'm also going to do the bottom at the exact same time. The bottom is only two inches thick, so it's going to be more so a traditional tenon. But since I already have this set up and they're the same distance from the edge, I just went through and started those as well. Once I had my first one done, I'm going to go through and mark all of my other pieces, making sure they're on the right sides. Um, and then I'll go through and I'll just repeat all of this stuff. So I like to mark these. These are rough marks just as a visual marker. When you're cutting four legs like this and everything has to be oriented on a particular side, um, it just makes my life easier when I'm going through all of them to have that mark and then I'll know I'm on the right side. So basically what I'm doing now is I move the fence back. I'm widening all these mortises and whenever this point going forward, whenever you see me do something on one of these, I'll be doing it on all four. So this is that haunch. It goes pretty quick because I'm not going um, down super deep and I moved it over and now I have that, that wide opening. So instead of three eighths of an inch, this is probably closer to, to about um, seven sixteenths. And then I could do the bottom as well with it moved over. It just helps with that extra bit of material. So you can see my marks are lined up. I'm only going to rem remove from this point forward the material where those arrows are. I'm going to leave the, the little striped parts open and that will create the mortises for my double tenon. At this point I'm going through pretty deeply. Like I said these were skinnier than I wanted and I wanted pretty deep mortises because this is a very large coffee table. So my mortises are going to meet at the end of the piece which also means that my tenons will meet and you'll see how I deal with that a little bit later on in the video. So this is the exact same process, so I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. Um, I already created that haunch. 
Now I'm going down and creating the entire mortise. It's going to be the same thing. I'm going to do the top and the bottom. The fence is set to give me my first cut. Once I do this on all of my pieces, I can adjust the depth of the fence and do the exact same thing. I can do both sides with the fence set the way it is because it's the same distance off that back side. So there's the double mortise. You can see there's a little, there's a hair bit of material, about an eighth of an inch more than that, that three eighths that I'll do. So there's the side I didn't do. And then I could send that through again as well. So pretty simple. I love this mortising machine. It, it makes life so much easier. If you don't have one, um, before I got this, I used to use a router. You get similar results. You just have to usually square up your corners or round over your tenons. And when I first started out, I used a, um, a drill press for all of this. So those are my, my joints laid out. And then I'm just calculating for how long my boards have to be for the tenons. Make sure you add on the thickness, uh, the depth they'll be going into the piece. And this is a five foot wide coffee table, but the entire top has about a one inch overhang. So the base of this is um, about two inches shorter length and, and, and width. So to start, I'm just gonna take these boards that I have and I'm gonna cut them down to size and then I'm gonna rip them down to width. Um, I didn't film a ton of this because this is pretty self-explanatory. This is the beauty of lumber like this. It's already surfaced on three sides. One edge is already straight, so I could take that straight edge to the table saw, rip all this stuff really quick and save myself a lot of time on these bigger builds with not having to, to uh, surface a bunch of lumber. Once that was done, I could go through and start marking for my tenons. Um, all these tenons are going to be the same depth and they're going to be cut similarly and I'm going to turn them into double tenons with a handsaw. So this is my mortise. That machine, um, that I've had that, that mortising bit in there for a while so it's a little rough. So I'm going to go through and hand chisel, just clean up the bottoms of these is usually where you need some cleanup. It's just easier to do it now than to put your tenons in and they don't really fit. As clean as they look, you could see when I flip this over, a bunch of little scraps will come out. And that doing that step now just um, makes it so that when you cut those tenons, they fit that much nicer. And then that is what those look like. I know there's shadows on these. I tried to get them where the, the light would hit. At this point, I currently do now, but at this point I hadn't set up my shop lights. So I do apologize. It, it's pretty dark in the shop at this point. So then for the tenon, it's obviously going to be the same thickness as the, the mortise. So you can see I made my center mark and then measured out equidistance on both sides. And I'm going to do a test cut. I always do a test cut with the tenons. I prefer to cut these on the radial arm saw because I can still use my table saw while I'm cutting these. It's really easy to cut lap joints and tenons on the radial arm saw. I can raise and lower the entire carriage of the saw extremely quickly. Um, really dial in that cut and you can see that's what it looks like. You could also see how the, it will overlay into the other, uh, the other tenon. Once I had that uh, fit, I could put a stop on the saw. You could see I can just cut all of these at once. So this is just a series of kerf cuts. I'm just removing the same material on both sides. I can flip it over and then do the same thing. I'll clean up the curves once I'm done. I could twist this around and make the exact same cuts. And then um, that's it's pretty self-explanatory at this point. I did all the bottom ones because like I said, these were just normal tenons because it's not thick enough to, to really need any sort of special, special workings going on. And then like I said, I could clean this up with a chisel. And that's basically what that's gonna look like. So then I could fit all of these in place. And then when I get up a little bit closer, you will see how one of these on each corner doesn't go all the way in because those, those tenons are too long. Now I knew this was gonna be a problem. I opted to do it this way so I could get that extra length. And all I'm gonna do is draw um, a 45 on both my corners, cut 45s on my corners, and then they'll fit in place. And then it's just some added extra glue um, in that joint. I opted to try a draw knife for this first. That worked really well. You can see I could just send it through pretty quickly. These are really long, so cutting something like this on the table saw is doable, 
but I don't have a huge um, bit of space to the side. So the longer they are, it's a little bit more difficult. And then after the draw knife, I've quickly discovered that doing this with a handsaw, I could get it accurately enough with one cut, and then it made it extremely simple going forward. That's what it looks like. Like I said, pretty simple. And I do that on all of my edges and then everything fit into place. Once I had that bottom base done, I could do the top and it's gonna start off as the exact same process. I'm not changing anything. My stop is the same spot. My depth of cut is the same spot. And I'm gonna go through and put that tenon on both of my sides. You can see how I have that set in place. I finished up the one to start. You can see the haunch at the top and then we're gonna have the same issue on these. I don't think I filmed this, but I did have to go through and add 45s to all of these, but you can see my tenons in there. I had a flashlight so that you could see the tenons in there, how they fit. And then you could get a better idea of what this joint is gonna look like uh, when I slide this first piece out. So that is what that looks like. And like I said, this is similar to how I do breadboard um, ends. It's just a nice solid joint, lots of surface area for gluing. Anytime you can multiply your surface area for gluing, the stronger the joint will be. So in order to cut these, the easiest way to do this is I just set this up in the joint and I can mark the material that has to be removed. So pretty simple. Then I could just make uh, darker marks. This is drawing for the haunch, which will be a, a ha about, it's about a half inch on the bottom. I'm not gonna touch that. I could extend my lines on the top with a square and then all I have to do is remove those little sections of wood. In the center, um, I'm gonna hand saw these out. It's easy enough to do in the shop. So this is about a 3 8 inch drill bit. I can drill a hole through that center there so that when I saw through all of these uh, lines, everything will pop out. And then from here, I know this joint looks a little complicated. It is more time consuming to make, but for a piece of furniture like this, it is worth the effort, especially the top side that will have all these mechanisms. You don't want these rails distorting on you. It makes for a nice solid joint that you'll never have to worry about. The customer will never have to worry about. You can see it's not that much more work. Um, for tenons like this, the rule of thumb I've always heard is anything over four inches, you wanna split into two. And one of the main reasons for that is it does amplify glue surface, but also if you're removing all this material out of the mortise, it then creates a weak joint for that, that the wood that is created with the mortise. You could see my mortises, I'm not taking out as much material. If you're removing a five or six inch bit of mortise with no haunches and no double tenons, it really weakens that, that joint. So then there are my two. I did it on both sides and then they could slide into place. And that is going to be, I think, where this video is about to stop. This was one of the longer processes. Building stuff like this always starts from the ground up. It's really important to start with a solid base, which is kind of how I, I work in this shop. And it's, it's worth the time and effort going forward. Everything's nice and square.